Welcome to the Ports Garrison. Please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you. Greetings. Welcome to the Ports Garrison. I am PD Port. If you're joining me for the first time, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to the channel and share the content if you like it and you so feel inclined to do. Now, today, I want to talk about Jamaica becoming a republic and the whole issue of the Caribbean Court of Justice. Now, it's been in the news recently, and I have spoken on this matter um, quite a few times. I have even said that I don't think this current government will make this a reality, the reality of Jamaica becoming a republic and cutting ties with the monarchy. Now, it looks like the government is about to prove me wrong. I have no problems with that, and I appreciate that, but there seems to be some issues that is going to snag the whole process and hold it back from progressing to where we all want it to get to. Now, I've been consistent in my support and my calls for Jamaica to become a republic for years. I mean, my, as I've said before, my, my first time to a traffic court, I was amazed at what went on in the, the rituals. And I want to make it to once and for all cut all ties with the monarchy and colonization. Clean cut. Um, I want a, a clean, clean cut. You know? I don't want a partial cut. No, I don't want something that's chaka chaka and jagged. I want it to be clean, clean, as them said, smooth. Now, no jagged edges, no blurred lines, nothing, but a straight, clean cut. Now, why do I say this? In my last video, I mentioned that the Minister of Constitutional Reform and Legal Affairs, Marlene Malou Fort, had gone to Parliament to give a report, a status report, on where the process was. And in that report, she mentioned the issues or the dis or disappointment in the position that the, the, the opposition had taken. She did say that the work was well advanced but the opposition in not naming its two members to the committee that would do the necessary groundwork to make the change a reality was holding up the process and she was really, really disappointed in that. Now in two consecutive sittings of the House of Representatives, there has been a series of back and forth between the opposition and the government. Um, particularly the opposition leader, Mark Golden, and the minister and Minister Mar Marlene Malawu Fort, uh, a series of back and forth. Now, before I misquote anybody, take a look at what the minister had to say regarding the, the progress so far and what was her concerns and her issues. Take a look. Sadly, Madam Speaker, the leader of the opposition has advised that the concerns he has um, are such that he will not be naming the members of the opposition to sit on the committee at this time. I don't think I can express sufficiently to the people of Jamaica how disappointed I am with this position. It has not taken me by surprise that there are matters that the parliamentary opposition feels strongly about, and in particular, the issue of the final court for Jamaica. But Madam Speaker, we do not at this time have consensus, even though we are agreed on many other things on the particular subject matter. So, we just heard the minister expressing her disappointments uh, by the position taken by the position, and she introduces an issue which the opposition feels strongly about. 
And if she, that she, according to her, did not take her by surprise, which is, the fine, which is the matter of the final court of appeal for Jamaica, she said that there is no consensus on this matter. No, I had to ask consensus between who? The government and the position or the government side? I wasn't clear as to where the consensus was, was lacking. Now, take a look and a listen to the opposition leader, Mark Golden, providing a timeline and outlining his issues. Here. Madam Speaker, I wrote to the minister on the 3rd of June, 2022, when she first rose, had written to me about this committee that she was proposing to set up and was seeking to have two representatives from the opposition to sit on it. I responded with some concerns and questions which I asked her to reply to. I didn't hear from her then. About a month later, I sent a follow-up letter requesting a reply. Since then, from time to time in conversation, I've had occasion to ask her please to write to me in response to my letter of June the 3rd. And several promises were made to do so. I received the response last Thursday. And that response set out some positions on the matters I had raised and asked me to respond with the naming of our committee members before today. I wrote to the minister again today, saying to her, first of all, that on the main issue on the table in terms of constitutional reform, which is for Jamaica to move from being ruled with a head of state, if not governed, by a monarch based in the UK to having a Jamaican head of state, a president, that as part of that process, we don't do it in a piecemeal way, but we complete our decolonization, achieve full sovereignty and political independence by moving away from the Queen's Privy Council as our final court and acceding to the jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice as our final court. The issue of access to justice for our people and access to their final court of appeal is a very real practical issue and the current arrangements are fundamentally inaccessible. Jamaicans need to have a visa to visit the UK as do their Jamaican council. And the cost inherent in a process of litigating in the United Kingdom, unless you're lucky enough to get pro bono, which means free of charge support from UK lawyers, which is usually in the context of death penalty cases, Jamaican litigants are unable to take their appeals there. So most matters which involve complex or important points of law end at the level of the Court of Appeal, which is not the final level of our ju judicial system. And this is hampering the development of our jurisprudence and fettering the right of our citizens to due process and access to justice. This is an important and fundamental matter for us, and we believe that both issues should be addressed at the same time. The Minister has also indicated that there is to be a referendum on the monarchy and on other matters, other matters which have not been disclosed to us. I have written to her to say I would like full and transparent disclosure of which amendments requiring a referendum the government is intent to pursue. I would like to know that before we embark on this committee exercise. The minister, the minister also indicated that part of this exercise is to do a review of the Charter of Rights. Now, the Charter of Rights was in, enacted in 2011 after a, dec a decade and a half 
of development, of work which was done together, both sides were involved, and it modernized the previous chapter three of the Constitution. That new chapter three, the Charter of Rights, has created a, an array of important rights for our people. Some of the provisions of it have been subject to litigation. Some of those matters are on, subject to appeals, which are pending. In my view, it is very early in the life of the Charter for us to be reviewing and seeking to amend it. I, also, the Minister, when she was Attorney General, told this House in, uh, that sometimes the rights of the people have to be abridged or abrogated. Now, in that context, and the context of the way in which the Constitution has been treated in the last several years, I've asked the Minister to disclose in a full and transparent way the specific changes to the Charter which the government is intent to pursue. I would like to know what those are before we embark on the exercise of reviewing. Before all of So it is not a question that I am refusing to nominate members from the opposition to sit on this committee, but I am asking and I expect and hope to receive the clarity, transparency and disclosure that we want and that the Jamaican people deserve as to where the government intends to go on these important matters. With that disclosure, we will feel much more comfortable that if we participate in this exercise, we are doing so with a, with a full understanding of where the government intends to go. There may be matters which are not technical legal matters, but are more issues of principle affecting the political system and the democratic system that we are all practitioners in, which may require some discussion to resolve those issues outside of the context of this committee of experts. So that is where we are today, and I would love to proceed and appoint our members to the committee, but I expect a response, giving the information which we have reasonably required, that the Jamaican people are entitled to know, and I hope that that reply won't take another six months, because everybody is frustrated that we are, seem to be no further along a year after this new ministry was created. So I urge the minister, I understand your disappointment, but put that behind you and let us try and sort this out so that we feel comfortable to go down the road with you, the particular road that you are seeking to travel on. And it is not that we are unwilling to do so, but we want to do so with a good understanding, a full understanding of the direction that you intend to take us when we go there. We don't want to be going there and to find that policy issues are being raised with which we have fundamental disagreements, and that would be counterproductive. Let us know where we stand at the outset so we can make it clear to you what our positions are on those issues, and maybe we can resolve them in, at a different, in a different way than a committee where we have two representatives would be at dealing with what I would regard as the more technical aspects of the issues. So that's where we stand. We are not intending to delay anything. We haven't taken six months to reply. I replied today, having been written to on Thursday. That reply came to me six months after my letter to the minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Having listened to Mr. Golden, it seems to me that he wants an agenda for the discussion or the consultations, and he wants them in writing. I see no, no big issue there. I mean, most of these things, when we go to a meeting, there's a written agenda. Um, and his issues are based on previous statements made by the minister when she had a different portfolio, I must add, and how the government has treated the constitution. Now, this sounds to me reasonable, but so why is there an issue? Now, 
Let's fast forward to the next city of the house. I think the first video you saw was on January 10th. Now let's fast forward to January 23rd, where the Minister of Legal, Legal and Constitutional Affairs once again rose to update the house on the progress in the matter. She had issues with a media release by the opposition. Let's take a look and a listen. This ministerial statement is intended to further update this Honorable House and the people of Jamaica on the status of the Constitutional Reform Committee, as well as to publicly set the record straight on the written and verbal exchanges between the leader of the opposition, the member from St. Andrew South, and me on the matter. And Madam Speaker, I confess that I'm experiencing mixed emotion because there has to be a proper place reserved for private communication as we set about doing the work assigned to us. But Madam Speaker, you may recall that when I spoke here in this Honorable House last week, I expressed deep disappointment at the stance that the Leader of the Opposition had taken to decline the government's invitation to participate in and name members of the parliamentary opposition to the Constitutional Reform Committee until um, some, his, his queries were answered in the way that he desired, among other things. Madam Speaker, later that said day of Tuesday, January 11, 2023, the leader of the opposition, SPNP, issued a media release under the caption, Series of Correspondence between Mark Golding, MP, and Marlene Malahu Ford, KC, MP. Attached to that release were four pieces of correspondence between the leader of the opposition and me regarding the proposed establishment of the Constitutional Reform Committee. Madam Speaker, the media release expressly stated that the series of, of correspondence began with a letter from Mark Golding to me on June 3, 2022, with a follow-up on June 22, 2022, my response some seven months after on January 5, 2023, and finally his response on January 10, 2023. Madam Speaker, the statement is plainly false. He did not begin the series of correspondence. And I should say that I did not receive any follow-up letter on June 2022. If he sent it, I didn't receive it. And I checked at my office and they said it was not received. But that aside, Madam Speaker, just to set the record straight, the correspondence between the leader of the opposition and me on this matter began with my letter to him of May 31, 2022. Now, to my mind, the issue that the minister is speaking about here seems insignificant to, in, to me, in my opinion, in relation to the whole matter at hand. She was concerned about who, about the accuracy as to who started the series of communications. Yes, Minister, accuracy matters. But in the grand scheme of things, the point as to who initiated what is, as I said before, to me, insignificant. The Minister further went on to speak on the concern that the move to Major Baker Republic ought to walk in tandem with the move to accede to the CCJ as our final court of appeal, the CCJ here is the Caribbean Court of Justice. Take a look and a listen to what the minister had to say. Madam Speaker, I should also like to share, as part of the record, my responses to the leader of opposition's concerns expressed in his letter to me, dated January 10, 2023. With respect to the first concern, which indicated that the move to make Jamaica a republic ought to walk in tandem with the move to accede to the CCJ 
as our final court of appeal. My response was as stated in the January 16, 2023 letter, a change of Jamaica's final court is not one which requires a referendum to effect. At this time, there is no consensus on making the Caribbean Court of Justice, CCJ, or final appellate court. Since the constitutional reform work is being done in phases, beginning with the matters requiring a referendum and on which there is consensus in phase one, it would be unwise to further delay the work now when ample opportunity will be provided with the assistance of the Constitutional Reform Committee to fully ventilate this issue at a later stage. In respect of the second concern, the Leader of the Opposition requested full and transparent disclosure of the specific changes to the Charter of rights that the government is intent to pursue and of the amendments requiring a referendum that the government intends to pursue other than moving to a republic. Madam Speaker, again I responded by making it clear that as I had repeatedly said before, we're not starting from scratch with these reforms. Instead, we're building on the work done by the Joint Select Committee on Constitutional and Electoral Reform and the Constitutional Commission, culminating in the recommendations set out in the 1995 report to the Parliament on which consensus was reached. Madam Speaker. Now again, we heard the Minister speaking to a lack of consensus in this matter. She then expressed a hope that the Leader of the Opposition will reconsider his position to twin ascension to the CCJ with the transition to a republic. Here, take another look and a listen. And Madam Speaker, it's really my hope that the Leader of the Opposition will reconsider his position to twin ascension to the appellate jurisdiction of the CCJ with abolition of the constitutional monarchy and the transition to a republic. Opposition Leader Mark Golden then rose to once again express the opposition position in the entire in the matter. Um, give his views as to what was the real issues um, affecting them. Now here, Mark Golden. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, the letter which I wrote to the minister at the beginning of June was expressly responding to her letter of, I think, May 31st, in which she had invited the opposition to name two members to the committee that she proposes to establish. I wrote at the beginning of June, setting out some concerns about the approach that was being taken. I didn't get a response. These were serious issues, which I wanted a formal response to, and I still do. I sent a follow-up letter three or so weeks later because I hadn't had a response. Now, I'm hearing from the minister now for the first time she didn't get the follow-up letter. Anyway, she hasn't denied getting the substantive letter which was sent at the beginning of June. We have had what I regard as casual and informal brief discussions in here on some of those issues. That is not a considered formal response of the government to the substantive issues raised by me as leader of the opposition in a formal letter to the minister. And I did not get that response for seven months until well into January. When I replied to, her, to that response in January, the minister came here and berated me in no uncertain terms. And I, that I felt and I still feel that it was necessary to bring to the attention of the country how that correspondence had unfolded and the disrespect with which I had been treated by her. Anyway, in her latest letter to me, which was received last Thursday evening when I was out of town, the minister went through a, another tirade before moving to the issues that I have asked her to provide full disclosure of. And I just wanted to read one sentence that the minister put in her letter to me. She says to me, 
Should you persist in your refusal or delay, you will force me to invite interested parliamentarians from your side to come on board. Now I tell you, I don't know how you want to embark on a process, a collaborative process, making remarks like that. I think that's totally inappropriate. Totally inappropriate. Madam Speaker, just for the record, I have written to the minister today. That letter is at her office. It's on her email. The, it is. I, I sent it before I came here. And, I have a, and it, my, my assistant emailed it to her and copied me. I received it. There are three issues. The first issue is the minister says there is no consensus at this time for moving ahead with full decolonization. Becoming a republic rather than having the British monarch as a head of state and have, moving to the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice established by Caribbean nations with intention to be the final court rather than Her Majesty's Privy Council, the Judicial Committee, sits in London, established in the 1830s, a colonial construct. I have said, you've said that there's no consensus to move with that at this time, and you want to take it in phases and deal with that after. And I've said to you, well, there's no consensus on our side for moving ahead in that piecemeal way. We want to move to full decolonization now. And no good reason has been put forward for delaying it. So I have not said we won't appoint members to the committee. In fact, my letter to that my letter to the minister says, if she responds to me and gives me the disclosure that I've asked for, reasonably asked for, I will appoint my members, the opposition members, forthwith. But there are some issues which I need to have clarity on before we embark on the process. Because when you talk about amending the Charter of Rights, and what the minister said is that we want to modernize the framework, I've asked her, what does that mean? What are the specific changes to the Charter of Rights that the government intends to pursue? She's been working, the minister has been working on this for a year. She, the minister well and knows what it is that they would like to see change in the Charter. I'm saying, please, make disclosure to us so that we can determine whether those things are acceptable or whether they require prior discussion. Now, the truth of the matter is, you cannot amend the Charter of Rights without both the government and the opposition being on board. So if you're interested in collaboration, just give me a respectful response to my request and give me the information that we need. The other question I've asked her is, because in her correspondence she mentions a referendum to deal with the monarchy and other matters, and I've said, what other matters are those that you would want to deal with in the referendum? The reason being, that a constitutional referendum is only required to change deeply entrenched provisions of which the monarchy is one. I would like to know which others the minister has in mind. In her letter to me, she says, has said, oh, section two needs to be amended because of what happened when section 50 was repealed. She hasn't said what that amendment is. I suppose she would like me to go and research it, but why not just tell me what you have in mind? And are there any other deeply entrenched provisions that you wish to amend. Let us stop this public cascas. I didn't come here to say, make this statement. I wrote you a letter today. And you come here for the second time in two weeks to berate me because I've asked you for full disclosure on what the government's intention is in relation to amending the Charter of Rights and what the government's intention is in relation to amending the Constitution when it comes to deeply entrenched provisions that require a referendum. I want to know that in advance. I think it's fair and reasonable because I don't want to go into a process where I am going to be somehow, our, we are going to be co-opted into a situation where we're down, going down the road which, which we have fundamental disagreement. I am hoping that is not the case. But as you know, Madam Speaker and members, the issue of the state of emergency regime is a very sensitive regime for us. We, for us on this side, for us on this side, clearly not for you, but for us it is. And you know, when you talk about modernizing the framework, I want to know what you consider that, what does that look like? 
I'm not asking you to draft the provisions, but I'd like to know the direction in fairly specific terms that you want to go in relation to any amendments to the Charter. So I've written to the Minister and I've asked her, please to let me have that information by the end of the week so that we can then respond and hopefully appoint our committee members, which we are ready and willing to do and I would like to do without wasting further time. And I hope we can take this discourse out of the public domain at this point. But I would ask her not to treat me with such disrespect when it comes to these issues because it's not necessary and it's not helpful. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Opposition leader Mark Golan spoke to being berated and disrespected by the minister. And we heard his issues, wanting to move to, to full decolonization, etc. Seeking a respectful response to his concerns. The minister once again rose and in the process got a bit personal. Take a look and a listen again to this final exchange, including the intervention by the Speaker of the House, stating that the conversations must be continued by official correspondence between the two parties. Here. Madam Speaker, just to say, just to say that accuracy matters. The Leader of the Opposition can be assured. I know his stance, because I... His stance is that if he don't design the process, if he don't like it, something wrong with it. That's general. No, he has said that. He has said that. I heard it with my own two Madam ears Speaker, in another forum. Madam, on a point of order, I have never said that I must design the process. I've simply asked for disclosure as to the amendments to the Charter that the government is intent to pursue because those affect the fundamental rights and freedoms of the Jamaican people. And I'd like to know where the government wants to take that. And the other thing is that I want to disclose as to which deeply entrenched provisions the government is intending to amend. Now, if they're purely issues of tidying up, all the, all the minister has to tell me is they're purely issues of tidying up. But if they're substantive things, I'd like to know what those are before we start in terms of where they want to go. And that's all I'm asking for. And I hope I can get it by Friday so that I can appoint the members of the committee. Madam Speaker. Madam uh, Speaker, the, the uh, leader said he wrote to me. I, I, I really do think that this conversation must be carried on between official correspondence between both parties at this point. Now, let me say here, here, Madam Speaker, I have in full agreement with you, maybe for those rare occasions, but I'm in total and full agreement. Now let me share my, my own personal thoughts and some of the information I've gathered in my research, I've been doing some research on the CCJ and the whole matter, um, as to why this matter appears to be stuck. Firstly, I do think that both the government and the opposition want to move Jamaica from the British monarchy and make Jamaica a republic. No problems there, I think they both want it to happen. The current government and its parent party has a long history with the Caribbean Court of Justice and other regional institutions to my mind. That for the opposition members to now turn its back on an idea cultivated by one of their leaders defy logic. Now, I'm not sure who, who owns the, the original concept of the Caribbean Court of, of Justice, but it was promoted in Jamaica by a certain former Prime Minister. It might come as a surprise to some that in 1970, former Prime Minister Hugh Shearer proposed that Jamaica join with other regional countries to form a Caribbean court. So, former Prime Minister, JLP Prime Minister, made this proposal. This was publicly declared at a regional head of government meeting in Kingston that was chaired by then Prime Minister Hugh Shearer. In 1988, then Prime Minister Edward Siaga dispatched his Attorney General, I think it was O.G. Arden, to the head of government's meeting in St. John's, Antigua and Barbuda to protest that the process, was, the process of establishing the court was taking too long. The Caribbean Court of Justice was established on April 15, 2005 and is in headquarters in Port of Spain in Trinidad and Tobago. Jamaica is one of its founding members. It is funded in perpetuity, in perpetuity by a U.S. $100 million trust grant, a trust fund, arranged by the Caribbean Development Bank. 
while member states pay back the loan. In layman's term, it simply means the term funded in perpetuity simply means that there is no end to the funding. So Jamaica and other countries will be paying forever. Paying for the loan to, get to develop it and the maintenance of it. Now, I am told that there is a notion that has arisen in the JMP circles that the financial contributions the country makes to the CCJ should be used to establish Jamaica's own court of appeal. Why? does this sound familiar and why have I heard this kind of thinking before? Why does this jog, it jogs my memory? Why are we against Caribbean unity? This reminds me of the position of the JNP and the West Indies Federation, which was established in 1958. The West Indies Federation comprised the 10 territories of Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, Jamaica, Montserrat, the then St. Kitts Nevis, Anguilla, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Trinidad and Tobago. Now, the Federation was established by the British Caribbean Federation Act of 1956 with the aim of establishing a political union among its members. So, so basically, they were saying the Caribbean will be one, there will be one prime minister, one currency, and, and so on. But this never became this never came to fruition because the decisive development which led to the demise of the Federation was the withdrawal of Jamaica, the largest member. So after conducting a national referendum in 1961 on its continued participation in the arrangement, that is Jamaica, the results of the ref referendum showed majority support in favor of withdrawing from the Federation. This was to lead to a movement within Jamaica for national independence from Britain. This also led to the now famous statement of Dr. Eric Williams, the then Premier of Trinidad and Tobago, who said, one from ten leaves not, is referring to the withdrawal of Jamaica and signifying and justifying the decision to withdraw Trinidad and Tobago from the, refer from the federal arrangement a short while later. You see, some Caribbean institutions of been established and have gone to prominence. I can think of the West Indies cricket team. I can think of the University of the West Indies as two prime examples of regional cooperation and what that has led to, to significance the world over. Now, we'll be paying forever for this court, yet we are not using it. What sense does that make? And it's not just Jamaica alone. There are 15 member states of CARICOM and of the 15, only Barbados, Belize, Guyana, and Dominica uses the CCJ as its final appellate court. Trinidad and Tobago, which became a republic in 1976, I repeat, 1976, I didn't even start high school at that time. So this makes it 47 years since the Trinidad became a republic. And yet it still uses the UK Privy Court or Privy Council as its final court of appeal. Now, I say shame on Jamaica, shame on Trinidad and Tobago, and shame on all the Caribbean countries that hasn't ascended to the CCJ as their final court of appeal. Now you may ask, what is the issue with the UK Privy Council and Caribbean Fox? For some, the UK Privy Council is seen as the last vestiges of colonialism. If we are removing the king as head of state, why are we still insisting on using their courts as our final say? As I said before, I want Jamaica to make a clean cut from Britain and colonialism. Colonialization. Clean, no chaka chaka, sharpest knife, sharpest scissors, sharpest razor required to make one clean, clean cut. You see, when a case is, up, is settled by the appeal court in Jamaica, for example, if one wants to appeal the judgment further, then they have to take it to the UK Privy Council all the way in London. Most Jamaican cases that reach the Privy Council are argued pro bono by British barristers, something like the the, the courts in Jamaica where you, if you don't have money um, to pay for a big chocolate, you get a, a, court, a, a, 
a lawyer assigned to you by the state of Jamaica. Huh? The vast majority of Jamaicans can't afford to take their cases to London, even assuming they or their lawyers could get the requisite visa to travel there in the first place. So, John Brown from Trelawney, the heirs of Trelawney, accused of murdering somebody. He has gone through the whole, the whole court system in Jamaica, gone to the final court of appeal in Jamaica, or the court of appeals. They found that he is guilty, but he knows in his heart that he's innocent. Now, in order for him to get justice, what does he need to do? Try to get a visa or the castle. This remember this is a poor man. Try to get a visa to go to England and lawyer. If a lawyer can go there, they get pro bono lawyer will take the work on feeling of a fine ticket, plane ticket, accommodation, and all of that. Now, if he can't afford this, then this case ends there. I mean, that is not fair to him. That's not giving him the best. The CCJ based in Port of Spain is altogether more accessible, starting with the right of Caribbean community to ask free movement within the community and the general lower cost of legal services in the Caribbean. Further, not only is the court able to move physically or from country to country, it also entertains technologically supported remote hearings with the judges at their base and other participants scattered around the region. So don't forget really getting a plane, jump on a plane, plane ticket, accommodation, they can do it remotely. Easy access. So one have to ask why would the government be opposed to this? Shouldn't justice and truth still be ours forever? Forever? See, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, PJ Patterson, has criticized Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago's delay in adopting the Caribbean Court of Justice as their final court of appeal. He said that after 50 years, right, then he must have been speaking in the past, 50 years of political independence, the two most populous and arguably most advanced social, political, and economic states of the Caribbean, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, continue to hang on to the most colonial of vestiges, the British Privy Council as their final court of appeal. This, he says, is notwithstanding the reality that both countries played significant roles in the establishment of the Caribbean Court of Justice. So again, I have to ask, what is really the issue? What is the problem? Is it really, I, I, I don't know. So I have to ask, is it a lack of confidence in ourselves? Why do we think that persons miles away from us in the UK would better understand our people? our laws, our challenges, our issues, our culture and traditions than our own Caribbean judges. Fact is, we have produced many international judges, judges who have even sat on the Sedbury Council, so it can't be a case of competence. In Jamaica, after many years of refusing to make the CCJ's final court of, of appeal to replace the British Privy Council, the Jamaica Labour Party in government in 2011 under the leadership of Prime Minister Bruce Golden indicated that the party would take steps to become a republic and to remove the Privy Council and install the CCJ as the final court of appeal. That means the party would take steps to make Jamaica accept the, the Caribbean Court of Appeal as its final court. The opposition's vote would be needed for constitutional change such as accepting the CCJ as the final appellate court as well as removing the king as head of state in Jamaica. However, in June of this year, sometime in the past, the new leader, Andrew Olness, having initially agreed to his predecessor's decision, changed his mind on supporting the CCJ and called for a referendum to allow the people to take a decision on replacing the Privy Council. See, the Privy Council itself said a referendum is not a legally required step in accordance with our constitution. So I discussed this, this, this matter, I've done some research myself, and I did discuss this matter with a friend of mine and I asked him why he thought the government would be against the CCJ. And he remarked, 
they have an instinctive, irrational, and deep-seated distrust for regional institutions. An inevitable side effect of being reflexively supine internationally. It's hard to believe in yourself if you face the world on your knees. It's hard to believe in yourself if you face the world on your knees. Deep, deep, deep indeed. He went on to say nothing to do with PMP or JLP business. This is so much bigger than that. This speaks to our very sense of self-worth and value. We devalue ourselves when we insist on attending the master's court as our final arbiter. The mind is still so firmly shackled with the slave chains. Still shackled in slavery, he said. A Gleaner 2015 story says, the British government says that it would not be offended if Jamaica decided to replace the United Kingdom based judi Judicial Committee of the Privy Council with the Caribbean Court of Justice as the country's final appellate court and remove the Queen then as the country's head of state. So they have no problem. They would welcome it if we did it, but we just don't want to do it. Three days for the abolition of the appeals to the Privy Council and for Jamaica to join the CCJ in its appellate jurisdiction have been passed in the House of Representatives. The bills, however, have been lingering on the table of the Senate as the government appears unable to secure support for at least one opposition senator to secure its passage. Now, note, this was in 2015. The roles were reversed. So the current opposition was then the government, and the current government was then the opposition. So their senators did not support it and blocked it, killed it dead. And right now, they don't want to go there. There's no consensus. They don't want to push on with it. So in closing, I want to quote a Queen, King's Council, no longer Queen's Council, a King's Council, Leslie Thomas, who says, contrary to the widely held belief that the Privy Council is more independent than the Caribbean Court of Justice, recent cases debunk this myth and in fact establish that the CCJ has in recent years been a much better protector of fundamental rights and the, than the Privy Council. See, this is really a critical matter. And I hope the government and the opposition can find common ground. A common ground that will let justice and truth be ours forever. You see, this is an issue that's going to become topical in the next 12, 12 months to, 12 to 16 months. Because the government is planning to have a referendum sometime in 2024. To make citizens, this is something that we have to get on board with. We have to get some information, knowledge, so we are armed with information when this matter comes, comes up. This is something we have to talk to our friends, our kids, everybody about. So, once again, until we meet again, I want to thank you for watching. I know you have your own opinions on this matter, so I want you to share them in, your, in the comment section. And until next time, I want to wish you all the best. And as usual, it's one love. Blessings. Thanks for watching.